All right, so in this discussion, we're gonna talk about the idea of special strengths. Um, so we're gonna be looking at here, some of these concepts we've, we've actually kind of, we have touched on in some other classes, but there's some, there's some newer ideas that'll be presented. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here, just different things we wanna consider when we're, we're selecting our exercises. So it, it does kind of, I would say, take on a little bit more of an advanced, um, advanced, way of looking at and selecting exercises. The other thing we'll also be looking at is again, just some foundational information regarding even like motor learning and movement. So all that's gonna be getting uh, covered within this talk. So just a special acknowledgement, uh, just to kind of talk about where this information is coming from, because I obviously this isn't in the, the textbook for the course, um, basically, I got this from a special strength for team sport manual in, in video library. This is where a lot of the information has come from. So I kind of just picked things out and summarized it based on that. Um, there's also a, a special strength ebook that kind of accompanied that um, written by Cameron Joss. So there's some good information I felt that I wanted to share with you all. So again, just to acknowledge where that information came from. And there's multiple cited sources even within those manuals. So I didn't cite each individual thing within this, but that's where that information has come from. And if, if you wanted to, to see that, I'd be happy to share with you. Um, and there's an accompanying DVD exercise library, which um, we, we may, if we have time in class, I may even uh, pop some of those uh, videos up for you to, to see in class if, if we get a chance to do so. Okay, so just looking at sport development. So this kind of looks at, again, some of that foundational information if we, if we look at the idea between sporting age versus, uh, versus training age. So we're basically there looking at the difference between, again, how long they've been in a sport versus how long they've been training for. So there's always this talk about the idea and, and some of what we're starting to see more and more, and I've mentioned this before, um, early specialization, um, and, and we look at a lot of individuals that early specialize. Now, this would be the sports where early specialization wouldn't really take place. In other words, there are some sports where early specialization could be appropriate, but it's not very many. For instance, like gymnastics is a sport where early specialization can, um, and again, taking into consideration the training and learning process with it is, is, is good and, and done well, um, where it can be appropriate. But most of, the, most of the typical sports that we look at, particularly in this country, are not good early specialization sports, like baseball, even you know soccer and, and things in those sports. They're not good early specialization. And what we tend to see in the research regarding early specialization is that really the athlete's best performances are when they're 15 to 16 years old, which that's not exactly the time you wanna peak. Um, so that what we tend to find is, so we do tend to see that a lot of these athletes from a skills perspective, yeah, they could, they, they do really well early on, but they peak and we've actually seen at like age 18, a lot of these athletes are burnt out. There's a high rate of injuries due to forced adaptation and, and overload. Again, a lot of the things we've we've talked about and looked at with youth training, and even some of the things that we've uh, were, were in the the textbook that we looked at this year for the um, the advanced strength and conditioning class, where we looked at with youth training the issues with that. Whereas with a multilateral program, the the performance improvements were continuous, and what we tended to find was the best performances were really over eighteen years of age and there's a lot of physical and mental maturation that occurs that helps that. So again, there there also tended to be more performance consistencies. So, you know, individuals in a multilateral program playing different sports throughout the year, they they tend to have a little bit more of a consistent sport performance. Um, and they also had a lower rate of injuries. Um, <clears throat> So we, we see over and over again, again, there, there's still kind of this thing where athletes want to play one sport all year round, or the other flip side to it is sometimes they may play multiple sports, but they're playing another sport. So in other words, like they're trying to play soccer, but there's a fall baseball league and they're trying to do both. It's not a good idea. Um, 
you know, we've we've come to this point where there is these sports all year round and, and we don't tend to see um, very good long term results. Again, in the short term, again, you do see good results, but it's short term. And again, you also run the risk of, again, the the increased injury situation, which we we've, we've already discussed. So we look at the four stages of, of movement. So I, I mentioned that we were going to be talking a little bit about, you know, just some some science regarding movement and, and some some of this information. We, we even talked about this yet. Um, some of the things we'll talk about later should, should hopefully sound familiar. So there's four stages of movement or kind of four stages of just like learning a skill, if you will. There's what we call the unconscious incompetent stage. Okay, so this is when an athlete does not move well and they're not aware of it. So whether this is a you know a young athlete learning something new or even someone who's a little bit older who's kind of trying to learn a new sport, it's that stage where um, <clears throat> they they don't move well with a skill or they don't possess the movement and they they don't understand like. Their body doesn't kind of tell them that they're doing something wrong. They don't feel it yet, if you will. Okay, that's the unconscious incompetence stage. Now, the conscious incompetence stage is where the athlete starts to understand the movement. Uh, they understand that it must be improved, but their execution's still not that good. Okay, so again, over time, take that same athlete. They kind of now know they're like, OK, I'm not good at this part or I'm having trouble with this. Like now they're starting to feel it, but they now start to know what it is that they're doing is wrong. Then there's the conscious competent. Now the athlete is good at the movement, but they really need to focus on it. So they really need to think about what they're doing. Um, and, and they can have a degree of efficiency with the movement, but they tend to do it really slow. Um, so they're, they're now doing the movement well, but the issue is they have to think about it and they have to do the movement slow, but they're still kind of, they're, they're still efficient from the standpoint they could complete the movement. Then there's the unconscious competent where now the athlete efficiently performs the movement, but it's automatic. This is, so this is like ideally where you want to be. So this is the stage where the athlete just does things without thinking about it. They can do it fast and efficient. So unlike the previous stage where, you know, they look, they can look good doing it, but they have to kind of do it in a little bit of a slower manner. With this, they can actually more or less kind of just go through the movement, not think about it and do it automatic. So this would be, this is obviously where we want the, the individual to, to truly get to when they're doing this. All right, the specialized foundation training. So what we, we take, we're going to take ourselves through here is just some different stages of training that we look at and, and kind of talk about what we, what we do in these individual phases and, and what our goals are. So the general physical preparedness or GPP, and again, this is the vast majority of what we tend to do in strength and conditioning. So we're looking to, to build a base of preparedness. We're looking to build general strength. We're looking to build, you know, general metabolic conditioning, which consists of a, you know, usually an aerobic base. And then typically, you know, again, the more depending on like what the sport does from like a time motion analysis and sprinting, we look to add that on to it. OK, that's the, the general physical preparedness, special physical preparedness means that we make them the adaptations more specific and we look at more skill orientated uh, stuff. So this is really what we look at regarding like, you know, starting to get a little closer to the sport form. So this is really kind of looking specifically, and this is truly where sport specificity comes in, is in the, the special physical preparedness. Um, now, there, there is a category that, that kind of fits sort of the, this is sort of the in-between, if you will, so it's not showing up on the in-between on the slide, but the general specific physical preparation. So this is kind of the middle ground between the GPP and the SPP, all right? This is where you, you prepare the body for specialized means, but it is still a little more, um, it's still a little more general in nature. Um, and we'll get into examples of, of 
where things fall into this, but this is kind of the in between. And again, what's what's general specific physical preparation for one sport may be more general physical preparedness than another. Again, you have to kind of be able to look at a sport, really be able to take apart its movements, really take really look at the energy system base, which I think by now, you know, you all should have, particularly in, in this course. Um, you know, if we're looking at the advanced strength conditioning course, you guys have kind of had all of that sort of foundational information and that should be there. Then there's the idea of the specialized foundational training. Um, this is the auxiliary training that sort of serves to prepare the muscles and connective tissue for the uh, special physical preparedness or the SPP and sport movement. So this is typically where we use a combination of movement planes. So this isn't going to be traditional weight room movements with specialized foundational training. Um, you, you may use resistance, but typically we're going to be looking at like multiple movement planes in order to um, kind of do the specialized foundational training. So again, when you're kind of planning out for a sport, you have to be considering what would fall into each one of these individual categories for the sport to truly make like a, a full, well-rounded program. All right, so looking at fundamental movements, and this is something that we've talked about before. I'm gonna expand on this a little bit. Um, I've talked about this in, in program design, but these are fundamental movements that we could look at when we're kind of setting a base for our exercise selection, okay? So we have push, we have pull, we have hinge, we have squat, okay? So obviously, you know, we think of exercises that would fall into these categories and what muscle groups would typically be worked. Obviously in the push group would be any type of pushing or pressing exercise, obviously would kind of stress those particular muscles, the, the pulling group. Um, again, from, you know, I know sometimes, and again, we have to be careful. So, you know, in like a bodybuilding split, a lot of sometimes athletes will put, or uh, bodybuilders will put, uh, deadlifting in a pulling movement. For the purposes of what we're talking about, that's going to be a hinge, okay? So pulling is going to primarily look at upper body pulling movements where the upper body muscles that produce that, that pulling action are stressed. Um, hinging is, uh, again, that movement at the hips, emphasizing, um, you know, movements that are going to really stress hip extension. Um, so again, you look at, for instance, your, your various deadlifting options, you know, straight leg deadlifts even as well. Um, obviously squat, anything with a squatting pattern. Now I'm going to add, um, <clears throat> I think when I've talked about movement patterns before, this literature adds in some extra stuff. So you have your unilateral movements, um, and that can be unilateral upper or lower body. Um, you know, you could do some unilateral upper body movements, but obviously there, it's very popular to do a lot of unilateral lower body movements, your lunges, your split squats, what have you. Um, rotation. So this would obviously be anything that stresses rotation at the torso. And, and I'm also going to add carries. Um, a lot of your uh, special strength exercises can include carrying movements. Again, I... Um, I definitely think over the past couple of years, at least for me, I see a lot of value in using weighted carries um, for various reasons. And again, weighted carries can be loaded in ways that work different aspects. So you can work strength, you can work, you know, if you want to work a little bit more hypertrophy, if you want to work more metabolic conditioning, um, if you want to kind of focus a little bit more on core stabilization. Again, the, the carries can kind of be manipulated to... Um, really what you want to to look at as far as um, your your adaptation that you want to get okay strength training movement patterns okay so this kind of just looks at this kind of takes that what I just talked about on the previous slide kind of kind of pulls out a little bit more different um, classifications and movement patterns um, so you have horizontal push and pull um, and again, so this, and again, a lot of this we, we've kind of discussed before. This just kind of looks at exercise selection. And, and the reason why this is good to bring up and the reason why it's discussed in, in the, the, the literature on this is because then it kind of makes some of the latter stuff a little bit easier to see. So you can have horizontal push and pull, vertical push and pull, um, quad dominant, hip dominant exercises, which are things we've talked about before. 
Um, so in other words, a quad dominant, if, if you're typically when you're classifying an exercise as a little bit more quad dominant, you're looking at basically the range of motion at the knee. If there's a lot of range of motion at the knee, that's a quad dominant movement. So, you know, I know typically like, you know, I, for instance, I teach in the resistance training class a little bit more of a, like a posterior chain dominant kind of squat where you're kind of sitting back more. That's still technically a quad dominant movement just because of the fact there's more range of motion at the knee as opposed to a hip dominant motion where a hinge is a little bit more, um, a little bit more your predominant motion. You look at rotation and also include anti-rotation in that as well. So we talk about for performance purposes and injury prevention, kind of addressing that kind of anti-movement with, uh, within the core, within the, the abdomen and the low back, which I think is important for athletes. Uh, we talked about carries, but also talking about dragging and pushing. So anything where, you know, a lot of your sled work and everything would, would kind of fall into this. So beyond just doing like the weighted carries, dragging, pushing a sled, pushing a prowler would be included in that. And then anything involving your grip. Um, so grip strength would be something that, again, is really important for most sports. We kind of, you know, you could kind of monitor overall even training fatigue by somebody's grip strength um, if, you, if you want it to as well. Okay, so going back to some movement stuff, so the squat hinge um, continuum. So again, this could be something that, you, you know, again, if, when you're trying to teach someone how to squat, as we all saw that, you know, in, in the resistance training course that we teach that the um, just teaching the squat can be a difficult thing where the squat does include a hinge type motion. So we're going to kind of look at kind of some things we could consider when teaching the, the, the squat hinge action and sort of what we want to look at movement wise for the different exercises. So we look at a front squat versus a back squat. So a couple things to look at. A front squat is a more vertically orientated exercise. So if you see individuals doing front squats, they tend to keep their torso a little bit more upright. Whereas on a back squat, it's kind of a little bit of a combo of vertical and horizontal movement. So in a back squat, you are gonna get typically a little bit of a greater forward lean. Um, Again, the amount of forward lean can kind of be dictated as well by how the person is built. Um, I wouldn't force a forward lean in the squat, meaning there are some individuals, if you you know, you go on the internet, you could kind of see there are a couple individuals who really kind of encourage people to almost artificially lean forward more than they really need to. Um, again, I would say that's based on body type um, you know, femur lengths, you know, the, the size of your torso are kind of things that would kind of dictate that. Um, so just in kind of looking at with any type of movement, you have a starting position, um, you have a transitional component, you have an ending position. The start and end are obviously the same because you always end up in the same position. Um, but again, what you want to do is kind of, if you could take the transitional component and divide it into phases, that tends to kind of help the learning process. Um, so there's a couple different things you can do here. Like for instance, one of the things that, um, for, for instance, at the, the, the bottom position in the squat, if you remember one of the ways I said that you can actually teach the squat is do it from the bottom up. So have them kind of sit on a box, put them in the position you want them in, and that could kind of almost pattern something kind of in their learning to where they kind of now know where they have to end up when they're done squatting. So that could be something that could be helpful to do. And again, another simple thing is, again, just start the movement at slow speeds. Um, you know, slowing down the movement a lot of times can just kind of help the nervous system kind of ingrain kind of those efficient movement mechanics um, and just make them a little bit more aware of their movement. If you think about going back to those four stages of movement, this could be a really key thing that somebody does to kind of help um, what it is they're doing and, and kind of learn it a little bit better. So as, you know, as we all kind of saw when we were all kind of learning the squat technique and everything, you know, how, you know, it could be a lot of stuff to have a lot of those cues. So these are just some different ways to kind of think about um, the type of squat pattern that you're doing in, in the, the athlete's learning process. 
So looking at categorizing specialized foundational means. So again, the goal here is to enhance the integrity of body structure. So we're looking to accumulate multiplanar forces and, and stresses on individuals. And again, for, for more pronounced training adaptations, um, special physical preparation and specialized tr strength training will be more appropriate. So basically, again, we eventually, again, all the single plane weight room stuff that we classically think of all very important to kind of build the foundation upon. So again, we don't want to start going crazy with like multi-planar exercises right away because, you know, many times the tissues aren't prepared for that, but it, gradually we want to get to that point, okay? Um, there's three areas to look at with this in, in the categories here. So you have independence, this should be used when joint movement capacity is lacking or inhibiting performance. Um, so some things that can be done that kind of address this, your self-massage, um, controlled articular rotations, which are basically just kind of like um, slow rotational movements. Um, these are actually, there's actually courses on controlled articular movements or CARS. Um, some of you may have, you know, just in kind of going around the internet may have heard about that, but that's something that, that can be an, an early thing to do. Then there's inclusion. That's where individuals build positional landmarks. Um, so control gets attained over a greater range of motion. So this is now where we start to include activities that are a little bit more difficult to do. Um, you know, push-ups with instability, um, or people call them chaos push-ups, rope climbing, sled dragging, um, anti-rotational sled drags, uh, pistol squats um, could be included in that. So you see now we're getting kind of beyond just kind of simple, almost passive means to, to more active things. And then there's integration. So this is now where we're truly gonna challenge different ranges of motion. Um, we're gonna do some transitional components into continuous movement. So. These would be things like the, the kettlebell get up, um, kettlebell cleans, um, you know, band resisted farmers walk, zigzag farmers walks. This is where we're just basically taking exercises and kind of adding now your more multi-planar things um, into, your, into your exercises. So some ways to kind of enhance dynamic movement control. So again, these are all things that could either help. They're, first of all, they could kind of cause different adaptations at the nervous system. Um, they can also kind of assist with, again, learning, learning exercises. So there's various ways these things could be um, used. They don't only have to be used for beginners or people just learning stuff. Um, positional isometrics are just that. So you're, you're stopping movements at certain parts within the range of motion. Um, so that would be where you're, you know, maybe, for instance, in a pressing motion, you're kind of, as you're lowering the bar, you're stopping at points within the range of motion. Those would be your, um, your positional isometrics. Um, there's eccentric quasi isometrics. Um, this is kind of a unique exercise and there's, there's different ways depending upon how you use these. So this is where you actually, in the, um, the stretch position of an exercise, you will actually pause and hold. And what's actually happening, so for instance, say you had a, uh, say you had, uh, you were doing a dumbbell fly, okay, for the, the pec muscles. Well, what you actually do with an eccentric quasi isometric is you actually hold the end position for a, a fairly long period of time, depending upon the adaptation you wanna do. And what's actually happening, so it's called an eccentric quasi isometric. So it is a quasi isometric from the sense that you're trying to hold the position, but gradually the muscle's gonna have to lengthen. So as it's fatiguing, you're actually getting more and more motion kind of out of that bottom position. Um, and there's different types of tissue adaptations depending upon how long you hold that bottom position for. So that's kind of a unique exercise um, technique to use. Some people use this to actually get range of motion out of muscles. It's actually sometimes a, a little bit more effective than just even doing static stretching for try, trying to help lengthen a muscle. Uh, there's super slow movements. Um, so this is just that. You're just doing the movement very slowly. So long, uh, long eccentric and even doing the, the concentric long and controlled. And then there's dynamic stabilization where you're using some things where, you know, you're using unstable um, 
implements, you know, using instability. Again, sometimes you do have to be careful with that. We talked about in other classes how that can be overused. But however, I do think there is a place for it. Um, so like, for instance, using like a band bell bar for a bench press, um, I do think working on that stability at times does, is, can be beneficial um, at, at certain times within the training. So here's another thing to, to look at regarding special strengths. And, and I'm not going to take too long with this. Um, if you want to pause the screen and, and, and kind of highlight this, but we've kind of shown this before. We talked about this in some early classes, the idea of the joint by joint approach. So all joints are meant to either stabilize or mo and, and mobilize, but there are joints within the body that favor one aspect of that over the other, okay? You know, so when you look at kinetic chain movements and you know, you know, functional activities, certain joints are more um, are are more adaptable to mobility. Some are more adaptable to stability. So we've talked about this before. So all the joints that are in yellow are are more adept at stabilizing. The joints in the pink are more adept at mobilizing. Okay. So, and we've kind of been, like I said, we've been through this, but this is an important aspect. So like I said, if you want to kind of, if you kind of don't remember it, you could kind of pause the screen a little bit and take a minute or two just to kind of look this over to see what areas are a little bit more adaptable or their purpose is a little bit more one versus the other. But this is something that's very important in a lot of this um, movement prep as well. Okay, so pre-training stabilization resync. So this is something that we've we've talked about and done. So this is again looking at core stabilization, more specifically looking at strengthening the the torso, the abdomen, low back, core, whatever term you want to use from it from an anti-movement perspective. Um, and there's there's things that come in that going even back to the joint by joint analysis that that comes into play when we look at this. Um, a lot of people have gotten into using uh, crawling and rolling patterns. So it's literally just that doing like, you know, rolling patterns on the floor where your core is stabilized. Uh, you know, it's just simple bear crawling patterns are, are really good for that. Um, another thing to look at is um, when you look at the idea of that whole mobility stability uh, joint by joint analysis, and this is something that you can see for yourself. So using um, the core needs to stabilize, for instance, for the hips to be mobile. Um, and what you actually will see, and I have up here the high tension planks, the high tension side planks. You could even see this in yourself. Sometimes with individuals, you get them to do a stabilization pattern. They actually then transiently will get increased rotation at their hips. So for instance, if you were to do like some front planks, particularly like a high tension front plank, like an RKC plank, and then try to um, mobilize your hip, you actually get greater hip external rotation after doing that. So anything that kind of works or activates that anterior core, um, you do get transient hip external rotation. Whereas the, the side planks, or the more lateral portion of the core, the obliques, um, you get transient hip internal rotation, okay? So for instance, if you were to then try to mobilize the hip into internal rotation, you actually get greater range of motion. And the reason for that is with the nervous system, if the nervous system senses that the core has been kind of stabilized, which is what it's supposed to do, again, this comes back to that joint by joint analysis, you actually can get greater hip mobility with that. Um, so we've talked about that with warm up even, like it's sometimes a good idea to maybe start the warm up, particularly in somebody that needs a little bit more ability in their hips with some basic um, anti-movement torso stabilization exercise, just because it then tends to open up their, their hips a little bit more um, with those particular movements. So strength training regressions and progressions. So what we'll just kind of talk about here, just some examples of ways that you could kind of, you know, if you want to work a movement um, based upon exercises we classically do, but maybe they're just not ready for it yet. So we'll talk about, we're basically gonna give an exercise. We're gonna talk about 
um, a regression for it. So an exercise you could do if they're like not quite ready for it or they just don't have the pattern down and then like a more advanced version. So for instance, for the bench press, a regression for the bench press would be a simple push up. Okay. So if, you know, they, they still aren't great with the bench press or maybe particularly a younger individual, they could do some push ups at first. A progression for it, like a more advanced thing, would be like a dynamic effort bench press with like, say, even bands or chains would be something to progress them to. Um, a barbell squat, a simple regression would be like a goblet squat to a box, okay? Again, these aren't the only things. These are just examples that I'm giving. You can think of others along the way as well. And a, a, a progression or a more advanced thing would be like doing max effort squats with maybe even like, again, some sort of accommodating resistance like chains or bands. Um, a barbell deadlift, simple regression, a kettlebell deadlift off mats. Um, I've done that with a lot of really young athletes, like just to teach them how to deadlift. Um, I'll have them just deadlift the kettlebell or have them do it off a mat just because sometimes like to get deep in a good deadlift position is kind of hard for them and they try to use their back a little bit too much. So sometimes having them doing it off a of mat, they can learn the pattern a little bit easier. Um, a progression for a deadlift could be like a three position deadlift isometric where you're kind of, um, as you're picking the bar off the floor, you're kind of stopping in, in each one of the positions coming up in the deadlift. Barbell military press, um, you could simply do a seated dumbbell military press. Um, a more advanced version could be including a power clean with the press. So do a, you know, basically do like a clean and jerk, um, or you could just do more of a clean and just still like more of a strict barbell military press. Split squats, um, you know, that one example could be a lunge with an ISO hold, or this could even be a situation where that eccentric quasi isometric could be used, um, a more advanced uh, version of a split squat could be like a rear foot elevated split squat holding dumbbells or maybe even holding one dumbbell to kind of challenge that frontal plane stability. Uh, Pull-ups. Um, Pull-ups tend to be something that need to be regressed a lot for individuals because they don't tend to be very good at them. Um, slow eccentric pull-ups could be used, so where they don't even do the concentric, they just kind of get assistance to kind of get themselves up. Um, band assisted pull-ups can also be done as well. The other side to that is like a band resisted pull-up. So somebody who's really good at them can either do band resisted or do some other sort of resisted pull-up. Um, lunges, um, again, a rear foot elevated split squat can be used here to regress a lunge um, as they get a little bit better. A safety bar reverse lunge could be something that can be used as a progression. Uh, power clean from the hang. Um, it says power clean from the hand. That should say hang. Um, yeah, I kind of sort of wrote a G in there. I don't know if that it didn't really come out very good, but that's what we were looking to do. Um, so again, a way to kind of regress that, you could do just like a Romanian deadlift into a power shrug. Um, as they would get better at that, they could do like different types of exercises where they combine movements. They could do a power clean into a, a depth jump. Um, things like that can be done to kind of progress the, uh, the power clean from the hang. So again, training means progressions and regressions. These are just some other things that can do that. So again, you wanna be thinking about your fundamental positions. Um, so fundamental positions going kind of from easy to hard. Um, you look at prone to supine to quadruped, half kneeling, tall kneeling, and standing obviously being the most advanced. Again, this is considering like what the movement entails. So in other words, like obviously like there's nothing from a squat you're going to learn from a prone position, but that's just kind of covering all the different positions that you would sort of look at um, and how you can progress them based upon the movement. The position of the load can matter relative to center of gravity. So, you know, whether you're, you know, kind of holding weight in the front, holding it on the back, you know, holding it off to the side, for instance, in like a carry or like a zercher position, which is something that's um, sometimes used for individuals. Just the load itself. 
Um, are you using straight weight? Are you using accommodating resistance? Are you using some sort of dynamic stabilization? So these are just all different things that can be utilized for that. Um, what starting position are they at? Um, so again, are they, you know, they starting at the beginning of the motion, the end of the motion? Um, this could also be done to kind of control weak points. You know, are you doing something from a deficit? Are you doing something full range, partial range of motion? Um, Rest periods, obviously now some of this stuff will, will be, will depend upon what the goal is. Um, you know, for instance, you know, hypertrophy versus maximum strength. There's different rest periods that you will use based upon what you're doing. Um, the implement and the tool that you're using, you know, is it just a straight barbell, a specialized barbell? Are you using something that's gonna incorporate some dynamic stabilization? Tempo and time under tension. Again, some of this can can be predicated based upon what your goals are in the treat in the uh, in the exercise session. You know, are you trying to emphasize an eccentric? Are they just learning the motion? Um, are they working more for hypertrophy? Are they trying to do more dynamic effort strength? That will kind of change the, how much time under tension you want. What type of stance you're using? Your grip width. Um, again, obviously with a lot of your upper body exercises, the grip width could, could vary the muscular actions. It can make an exercise harder or easier for somebody. And then your grip strength um, is something else to, to consider with this. Again, not all of these, um, again, this is a list of things where not all of this is gonna be applicable all the time with every exercise, but they're just, again, considerations that you look at as far as you know, making something easier, making something harder, um, making something more specific, um, kind of along that, that specificity continuum that we talked about, and also, again, what, what type of exercise they're, they're actually trying to do.